Hello, everyone, and welcome to the History of Garden and Landscape Seminar. This is the fourth seminar of the term, uh, and we're delighted to, that you've come back. Um, I just uh, do a few little reminders to remind you to please mute your computer, your uh, computer, uh, and turn off your video. Uh, and to remind you that your qu questions at the end, could you type them into the chat box and um, our, our convener, uh, Pippa Pott, will, um, will convey them on to Catherine Van Olden. Uh, I think that's all the practical things. Um, as some of you know, we open the summer term to PhD and MA students to present work in progress. Catherine Van Olden, our speaker today, is one uh, who has responded to our call. Catherine is a student uh, in uh, a research student in design at Glasgow School of Art. Her work has been exhibited in solo groups, in solos and in group exhibitions in Belgium, France, the UK, and the Netherlands. She started the Save the, the, the Save the Loom Foundation, an interdisciplinary art project uh, set up to conduct research into the influence of sensory experience into the production of art uh, and, and uh, production and processes and explore the significance of handicraft in cultural history. She is also studying philosophy at the University of Groningen. Uh, and organizes Scholars for Sustainability for the Green Office there. Uh, Catherine, it's a pleasure to have you, and over to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I'm going to try to flip over to my presentation. So let's try it, if it works. And here we go, it works. Um, I've, first of all, I want you all uh, to thank uh, for being here for and also the Institute of Historic Research for this invitation to present my project. Um, I am a multimedia visual artist. I am primarily a printer and a weaver. And today I'm going to present you a part of my practice based research PhD at the School of Design at Glasgow School of Art. Uh, hopefully it will be later on a small publication. Anyway, my supervisors are Dr. Frances Robertson, uh, Dr. Helen McCormack, Edwin Pixon, and Eve McCarrickle. And my thesis is called Japanese Knotweed, Fallopia japonica, Realizing Non-Human Living Agency in the Anthropocene. This quality of research... Catherine, yes. may I interrupt? I'm yes. sorry, Wait, no one can see the images. Can't, you can't see the images? No, they can't. I think oh, there's okay. a couple of people listening. I will share. Thank you. Just a second. I will share my content again, screen. Wait, uh, screen. So sorry about that. I thought we were all set, but anyhow. <laughs> okay. How is it now? Can you see it? Uh, yes, now we can. Thank you. Okay. Is my mic on? Your mic is on too. You're, that's perfect. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Here we go. So the objective, the objectives of my quality of research asks if the image of the Japanese knotweed as a hostile invader can be transformed through making art. And it also concerns forms of artistic knowledge production in times of global connectivity and political change. This all surrounding the image of the Japanese knotweed. My methodology involves art and design that is collaborative and participatory, and it is engaging people and communities in social interaction through workshops and webinars. The actor network theory of Bruno Latour provides a starting point for a clear and distinct rendition of the complexity of the associations the Japanese knotweed forms with others. And besides that, I am also making use of planned printing. The results up till now are um, not definite, but what we can see already is that art making together brings about awareness of the position of the Japanese knotweed and also our perception of nature. 
No conclusions have been made yet, but joining forces with the audience, it is my intention to change the public perceptions and representations of the Japanese knotweed and demonstrate that art can change the world. How did I get there? Well, I got there because when I arrived in Glasgow in uh, 2016 to do my NLIT there, I was instantly in investigating weeds, weeds as being uninvited guests, weeds as being the weird kid on the block. Like I'm a weird kid sometimes, I feel like a weird kid, and maybe some of you feel sometimes also as a weird kid. But anyway, weeds are useless which is very important in this possession society. We are autonomous and we are also pioneers. And at the time, my research question was, in what way, when speaking about nature, are plants, notably weeds, different than human beings? At the time, I came upon the reform of antisocial behavior by the Home Office in 2014, defining the Japanese knotweed as the enemy, the other, and a player to be reckoned with, the state versus the plant. And I wondered what was happening to this once prize-winning status symbol and now an enemy of the state. On the left, you see the invitation I sent out at the time and on the right, large screen print poster. Incidentally, all the artwork that you see is printed by me sometimes hand printed, sometimes screen printed. Um, for my PhD, I founded the Weird Kid Project with Weird Kid Sessions, a newsletter and a website to inform you and the audience about my discoveries, exhibitions, artworks, and thesis. At the end of the presentation, I will show you uh, the site and the how you can note that down. This is set up to investigate an analyze the images of the Japanese knotweed, setting them straight through information, collaboration, and participation, as I'm doing that today to you. The Weird Kid Project develops activities such as webinars, debates, lectures, and exhibitions in cooperation with artists, scientists, as Professor Dixon later on, philosophers, specialists, communities, and of course, the public. Walter Benjamin says, there is no document of civilization, which is not at the same time a document of barbarism. Of course, at the time he was referring to uh, World War II and the uh, political climate, but in his most general sense, the word signifies slavery, class exploitation, or any other brutal system of social domination. Benjamin associated with the horror felt in contemplating cultural treasures that owe their existence not only to great minds and talents, but to the anonymous toil of their contemporaries. Why is this issue of the Japanese knotweed so important? Well, the issue of the Japanese knotweed having a non-human -age agency in our age of the Anthropocene is an increasing challenge to a European conceptual framework that views non-humans and humans as intrinsically different. In this anthropocentric frame, non-humans are regarded as counterparts to human subjects, the latter with conscious intent and agency and the former without. Who are the key players in this subject? Well, the key players, according to Latour, the system of Latour, the theory of Latour, are, of course, the Japanese knotweed, his relations with von Siebold, with Europe, with the Anthropocene, and nature. The Japanese knotweed, I will show you some pictures of it now. This is one picture, and it is a... Um, a uh, colored print from the lithography in the Flora Japonica by, drawn by Sebastian Minzinger. And Minzinger was a drawer for um, Zuccarini. Zuccarini shared with Flora Japonica, the Flora Japonica with uh, von Siebold. And Minzinger based this print upon an original illustration prepared by Kiga Kabahara. Kiga was the drawer who went with von Siebold on his trips and documented a lot of um, artifacts that he found, that von Siebold found. 
Uh, Zuccarini uh, was a professor of agriculture botany at the Munich University at the time. And he started with the uh, Flora Japonica uh, in 1835 in collaboration with Volsibold. And it wasn't completed until 1870, 40 years after Volsibold's death. This is a picture that I show you. Uh, and it served William Robinson in his first edition of the Wild Garden, providing advice for how best to use the plant. And for the, he writes, uh, Robinson writes, von Siebold's Persicaria, Polygodum Siebold in Japan. And he says, and it's a herbaceous perennial. It grows until four to six feet. It's yellowish green. It flowers in summer. You get propagation through division, divisions or cuttings. It's an isolated specimen and preferably on pleasure ground walks. It's most striking in that position. It can be associated with the most vigorous herbaceous plants cultivated for the effect of their leaves or habit. Obviously, William Robinson was a fan of the Japanese knotweed. But by 1874, with a few more years of experience, he still much appreciates the ornamental qualities of the Japanese knotweed, though he's gently warning for its rambling capacities. So he writes, as I now write, one of our finest and most effective plants in respect of habit, as well as bloom, is the Japanese polygonum ziboli. Of course, Siebold named everything to him. Siebold, sometimes you find them, Siboldi or Siboldi Isokarimi. It's sometimes also called, says William Robinson, also Cuspidatum. It has this season attained a height of nine or 10 feet, carrying its foliage from the very base in fully developed perfection. And now its beautiful branches are pendant in graceful curves. With a weight of feathery flowers, individual small and inconspicuous, but in mass and arrangement, the very perfection of beauty. Here you don't see the Japanese knotweed, but I wanted to show you a elex drawing of Kawahara Kega, uh, demonstrating a different manner of botanical drawing than ours. What you see is no roots. It is about the personality of the plant, its relations, its symbolic meaning and other social information. His botanical design represents the metaphysical world. It is European objectification of nature, which must have been strange to Kira, having been educated in neo-Confucian thought in which humans are part of nature. Representations of plants often refer to cosmology and this, anthropocosmic view of nature implied a certain moral value and a protectionist attitude towards nature. In this context, the shipping of plants and crates, turning them into commodities, could have been a function for him too. I will show you later. Before the Meiji Restoration and the introduction of Western society, nature was considered in Japan as a benevolent friend. Intimately integrated with nature, it wasn't possible neither desirable for a human being to identify nature, identify nature as a separate thing. Those interested in natural science followed the footsteps of Confucius. Nature, according to neo-Confucian humanism, revealed a universal moral order that instigated human social order. Subsequently, scholars studied biology and medicine within the context of nature, humanity and social virtue. These were the scientists that came to study at von Siebold's. Japanese science showed already signs of natural common sense at the time, folk biological and scientific taxonomy. Identifying species by their distinct physiological characteristics, by their social virtues and their life habits was a mixed form of botany avant la lettre. On the presumption that Kia lacked the knowledge to make accurate scientific representations in a Western European manner, von Siebold asked de Villeneuve, the new illustrator, to educate Kiga in botanical drawing. And thus, when von Siebold writes his letter asking the Dutch government for an illustration assistant, it is a request to strengthen his contribution to scientific European knowledge. In fact, 
van Siebold controlled his pathetical illustrations. This makes one wonder what other Japanese knowledge of plants have we been missing out because of this approach. Here you see von Siebold. And von Siebold set foot on the 9th of August, 1823, as an educated physician on Deshima, the artificial island in the Bay of Nagasaki, which had since 1641 the Dutch trading post in Japan. Famous predecessors on Deshima were physicians Engelbert Kempfer, also German, and the Swede Carl Peter Thunberg, both in Dutch service. Von Siebold had read the travel narratives of the two men and had the greatest praise and respect for them. He wanted to be like them and like Linnaeus. Von Siebold left farther east in 1822 as a surgeon major to take care of the soldiers of the Dutch Indian Army on Java, one of the Dutch colonies. But from the start, it would be his mission to gather information about the natural circumstances of Japan its products, its legislation, and the possibilities for an extension of trade. During this period, the governor of Deshima, with a few others, had to make an official journey to Edo, the seat of the Tokugawa Shogun, who held de facto sway over the country. Von Sibel took part in the journey in 1826, and the Japanese painter Kiga Kawahara was also in the delegation that undertook the official journey. Kamaha already documented with his paintings many aspects of life on Deshima, which in itself was extraordinary, as Deshima was Dutch and the shogun was vigilant on close contacts between the foreigners and the Japanese. And that also was strange because for, and, uh, for, for Siebold, Kaga also painted hundreds of species of plants and animals. At the court of the shogun, von Siebold met, among others, the shogun's eye specialist, who wished to improve his own expertise in the field of eye complaints, and in particular wanted to get hold of some medication to dilate pupils, such as belladonna, which von Siebold also used. Von Siebold conveyed to the eye doctor the procedure by which to prepare this and executed an eye operation on one of the nobles. In return, the eye doctor gave von Siebold a ceremonial kimono with the seal of the shogun. It was strictly forbidden to give such a kimono to a foreigner, and no foreigner could accept such a gift. With gifts from patients, von Siebold received some artifacts which he added to his collection. On July the 7th, 1830, he was forced to return to the Netherlands with his natural history and ethnographic collections on board of the Java, the ship. The collection of items of natural history comprising dried and living plants and prepared mammals, amphibians, fish, birds and insects was meant for the Royal Museum of Natural History set up in 1820, which is now called Naturalis and just had won a prize last year for one of the most beautiful museums of Europe and the ethnographic collection, and it was almost immediately purchased by King William I, of course. For Siebold was authorized to keep it for the time being first in his hometown, Forsmoten, but from 1832 at the Rapenburg in Leiden, the present Siebold House, the Japan Museum, since von Siebold needed this collection for his magnum opus, Nippon, and I will show you later on his house and his garden. And it was also lent to Zuccarini, Zuccarini needed it for, as you can see here, for the Flora Japonica, earlier mentioned. In his work on Nippon, he was assisted by many drawers for symbols, including the aforementioned Kawahara Kiga and Hoffman, a hitherto unemployed philologist. Thanks to this large number of collaborators, Fosibot thus developed from a physician to a prominent and broadly oriented Japan connoisseur. Most of all, he was interested in the geography of northern Japan and eastern Siberia and Russia. And the letter led to a run-in with the Japanese authority. He was unmasked as a spy because it was given that he was in possession of a number of land maps. And in 1829, he was banned from Japan in perpetuity, but he was given forgiven for a while after all. Here I show you two of early representation of the 
uh, Japanese knotweed. And this is an illustration in the Houtstime catalog. It was originally described as Reinhardt Tria Japonica by Houtan in 1777, so long before von Siebold from Japan, and the name was lost to botanists for over 150 years. In the meantime, the same species was independently named by Polygotum cuspidatum by Zibot and Zuccarini in 1845. Incidentally, after the publicity surrounding Zibot's description of Japanese knotweed, it was discovered that there had in fact been an earlier introduction of the plant to London in 1825. One fault it has, says William Robinson, that it is a sad rambler. So much so that in a very few years, the single plant would cover half an acre of ground. And it will hold its own with a vigor and persistency that annihilates all competitors. This is now our Japanese knotweed, the invasive plant that eats the value of your house, as the Guardian said. The knotweed is now considered one of the most hostile of invaders, threatening the foundations of houses, undermining other native species, and challenging statutory controls to contain and control its agency. How did it get to Europe? Well, what you see here on the left side is the folding screen, which was recently discovered um, and is now in Naturalis in Leiden, uh, imagining the port of Deshima. Deshima is the half circuit peninsula artificial peninsula, and uh, as you can see here, and you can see the Dutch fleet getting in there. And the Port Deshima had been permitted in accordance with the isolationist foreign policy of the Japanese Tokugawa shogunate to receive no other merchants than Chinese and Dutch. Control of important goods was exercised by the Japanese with a censorship that decide, decided what foreign knowledge was acceptable to influence the country. In this xenophobic and isolationist atmosphere, Kiga was employed by von Siebold. Kiga was skilled in both Japanese and Western painting techniques, and this combination of skills allowed him to capture the sweeping panorama of the Bay of Nagasaki on the large format of the screen on the left side, that's four and a half meters wide. The great variety in Kida's oeuvre provides a unique insight into early 19th century Japan, which I will show you later on. Fosibo writes in his diaries, introducing his enterprises to the court of the shogun in Edo that Kega, also known by the name of Toyosuke, traveled in his company. And he says, Toyosuke is a very accomplished artist from Nagasaki. He's accomplished in plant drawing, imitating European style in portraits and landscape drawing. There was a prohibition on the presence of European women on Deshima. A number of men, however, had a relationship with Japanese women. Von Siebold had a relationship with Sonogi Otaki, also known as Kusumoto Taki, after whom he named a variant of Hortensia, called the Hydrangea Macrophilia Otaxa. And Otaxa is the woman on the left side. During a visit to a merchant in Nagasaki, Von Siebold met his daughter, the then 16-year-old Kusumoto Otaki who he fell in love with instantly. No women and children were allowed on Deshima, except courtesans. In order to be with her lover, Kusumoto, her father, had Otaki registered at a courtesan house where she worked under the name Sonogi. And she had, of course, only one client, which was from Siebold. They had a daughter, Kusumoto Ini. You see her in the middle and on the right side, who would become the first female Japanese court physician. Neither of them could accompany von Siebold on his voyage back to Europe, and they both stayed in Japan. There are some heartbreaking stories about that. And the other story is also that the famous daughter, Ini, who was the uh, physician to the court, had the same 
furious character as von Siebold, but still she was very noted and appraised for her knowledge. In 1830, von Siebold came for the last time back to the Netherlands after a stopover at the Cape of Good Hope and among others to provide his plants with fresh water. And we have to realize that such a journey with a sailing vessel lasted a number of months and that the wardian cases, as he had projected, the small glass greenhouses with their own microclimates were only invented in 1836 by the English doctor Nathaniel Ward. The transport of plants was not easy. Plants were transported below deck the crew didn't care much and neglected the plants, and therefore Dr. Ward's little greenhouses above deck allowed a better survival rate for the plants. They were protected and they received some light. For Siebold must have taken many seeds, bulbs, tubers, and rootstocks with him, but also many plants. He brought about 700 different sorts of Japanese plants, mostly exotic novelties with him to Europe. And of course, a number of them did not survive this journey to Europe. But Kega's significance, this is incidentally the backside of the folding screen, doesn't rest solely with his folding screen. Kega was originally known for his delicate portraits of foreigners, notably Dutch predecessors of Fossimov, specialized in representations of family groups. Although he belonged to a long tradition of Japanese linear portrait painting, it was nevertheless influenced by Western European portraiture. Widely appreciated for his designs, a melange of Japanese traditional artistic two-dimensional design and Western posture, this is, most of his paintings were executed in water-based paint in the traditional Japanese method. This is the portrait of Jan Kok Blomhoff and his family being exemplary of Kiga's manner of drawing. His delicate lines, minute detailing, and soft shading in his two-dimensional representation. The clear patterns of textile against the back beige background from an example of traditional Japanese aesthetic. For that, you should have, I can enlarge it a second so you can see it. In the middle of the painting, you see the wife of uh, uh, Blomov, and um, that is Titia Bergsma, and I think she's quite an interesting character because she is uh, a feminist avant la lettre. The Dutch and Chinese were allowed to visit the country, but only for trade, and no women, as said, were permitted. The governor of Nagasaki allowed Titia Bergsma Bergsma to enter the island. There are some books saying that she refused to leave her husband and she was adamant on being on that island. Five weeks later, when the shogun Tokugawa became aware of her presence, he ordered that Titia and the wet nurse Petronella Muntz, who you see here, here standing in between uh, Blomhoff and Titia, had to leave it. In December, the women went back to Batavia and Holland and Bergma, Bergma never saw her husband again. In the meanwhile, Japanese painters and sculptors had made 500 images of Bergma. She was a very large white woman, which the Japanese never saw. Her images had such popularity in Japan that they outsold all other prints in 19th century Japan. And still you can find some images in Japan. Here you see another picture of Kega, a tea party with a view on the incoming flute, fleet of uh, the Dutch. This is the post, and if you look well, this is also by Kega Kamara. It's the arrival of a Dutch ship in Nagasaki. Nagasaki and von Siebold is looking through a telescope. Present, if you look well, are also his wife, Kosumoto Taki, and their daughter, Kosumoto Ini. Uh, in the blue kimono. And on the right, you see a view from the water to Tsushima. Here you see the garden of von Siebold. Uh, von Siebold had a hospital near to his house and of course a herbaceous garden to make his medication. And from all over Japan, people came as said to study with von Siebold. 
This is the house, in the middle is the house of von Siebold, which is now the museum. On the left side, part of the uh, artifact uh, uh, collection. And on the right, you see a part of the Japanese garden at the museum, in which there are some of Siebold's plants. This is not uh, the um, Japanese knotweed, but I want to show it to you because it's a notebook of Kega. And here again, you can see the different manner of botanical drawing. The Japanese knotweed is a plant in the knotweed family called Polygonacea. It is mentioned by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources as one of the 100 most pervasive species in the world. There are also less rampant varieties, such as the Floria ponica variatata compacta, the Varia gata, and Crimson Beauty, which can be planted as ornamentals or as ground cover. Research shows that a great number of plants brought to Europe by von Siebold are still popular garden plants. Many of them go wild and are then removed, like the Hilangia paniculata, the Osta, the Alcuba, the Skibia, and the Japanese knotweed. Gardens are plucked up, roots are left behind, earth is thrown away, and that is how, amongst others, wild fairer plants appear. Moreover, the first Japanese plants were introduced to Europe by German physician Kempfer, who had, amongst others, brought it in 1700, 1703 some seeds of ginkgo biloba. But Japanese knotweed too, a beloved plant which in Japan served as decoration in Buddhist temples, had already been sent to Europe in the early 17th century. In 1850, von Siebold sends a consignment of plants, including Renautica japonica, to Kew Gardens. And he hopes that his gesture will be reciprocated by Kew with a consignment of a new plants, of their new plants from China and Japan. It seems that von Siebold Japanese knotweed was planted in their gardens and even given to a nursery. But Q didn't respond to von Siebold's gesture. Von Siebold wanted to commercialize his plant hobby, also in order to fill his coffers for all his voyages of discovery. He established a catalog of plants in which he offered for sale not only his own plants, but also those of his botanist colleagues. To allow the plants to acclimatize after their arrival, he set up an acclimatization, acclimatization nursery in his garden in Leiden at his house that we just recently saw. In 1848, the time has come and he offers Japanese knotweed for sale under the name of Polygonum Ziboldi. He demands a lot of money for it, more than the yearly salary of an ordinary man, but a few years later, he lowers the price and he writes the following. This knotweed is one of our most important introductions from Japan, a perennial ornamental plant, inextirpable, with shining foliage, clusters of very graceful flowers, useful in creating growth, sheltering young plantings and fortifying sandy hills and dunes. The plant, which can be cut in the spring many times over, provides an excellent forage for fattening livestock, which eat it out, out of preference. The flowers, which appear in autumn, are very sweet and give bees winter food. The bitter tonicum is a medicine for, of repute among the Chinese and the Japanese. And finally, even these stalks, which die in winter, are good for burning and for matches. Already there have been very satisfactory trials stabilizing trenches and slopes along railroad tracks and sandbanks with plantings of this arborescence in extirpable plant. And that's what he said. Now go back to the Anthropocene. Over the last 11,000 and something years, roughly human beings have spread all over the earth. The actor network theory of Bruno Latour provides a starting point for a clear and distinct rendition of the complexity of the association the Japanese knotweed forms with others in this Anthropocene. Latour argues that the fundamental relationships 
between art, science and politics in the Anthropocene have not changed since the 18th and 19th centuries, when the crucial inventions of class, citizenship and the social question, among others, were made possible by a range of equally important actors, from novelists and political philosophers to statisticians and geographers. Europe by night, one of those results. And this is the Forest Landscape Integrity Index showing anthropogenic modification of remaining forest. We humans have grown in numbers and we have deeply altered the material world, making use of all that our environment offered us. I wanted to show to you on the left side, illustrating man's symbiotic relationship with nature, a very famous sculpture by Giuseppe Pinoni, and he is called the hand fused, fused with a tree trunk, executed in the Piemonte in 1968, and it consists of a bronze hand gripping the trunk of a sapling. Over the years, the tree and the hand have become fused. And on the right side, I wanted to show you the holes, the man-made holes that the Guardian publicized. It, it is more holes, it's more craters in the earth. In itself, there's nothing extraordinary from a biolog biological perspective about humans being the agents of ecological change and environmental upheaval. After all, every species on earth alters its environment. That is also what the hand of Pinoni shows us. The complexity of the Earth's landscape hasn't occurred haphazardly through, amongst other geology and the climate, but it is the result of organisms which have been at work for billions of years. Composition, decomposition, multiplication, extinction, erosion, appropriation. Some species survive, other species disappear. One of the literally great examples is the so-called American interchange, when three million years ago, the North American fauna crossed the new isthmus of Panama and conquered South America. Mass extinction through predation and competition. The rapidity with which human, humanity adapts and the arrogance with which it has plotted its course are of completely different order than the movement of nature's I have just outlined it. Within one generation, we are in a position to immunize ourselves, to go to Mars and to develop nanotechnology instigating climate changes. The term Anthropocene to describe the human dominance of biological, chemical and geological processes on earth was coined in 2000 in an article jointly written by Paul Kutzen and Eugene Stürmer. They dated its emergence to the latter part of the 18th century, admitting that alternative proposal can be made. Some may even want to include the entire Holocene. Others talk of the capitalist thing from capitalism or the kleptocene, ongoing theft of land, human and non-human lives. It was decided finally by geologists after some voting that the Anthropocene would be said to begin in the middle of the 20th century. However it may be, Anthropocene is a term used to indicate the footprint of human beings on Earth. In accordance with Latour, I think that what may seem to complicate the fundamental relation among art, science and politics in the Anthropocene is a certain lacking or disparate sensitivity to three aesthetics, science, politics and art in our handling of it, what Latour, Latour calls the ecological questions of our age. We need to understand these phenomena with artistic sensitivity. And that is why we organize printing workshops while discussing plants, politics, and aesthetics. We, as in the Weed Kit Project. Back to the Japanese knotweed, which is accused nowadays of causing the extinction of native species, amongst others, like men, for example. 
we have seen above that we have, I tend to think, reached a new historical situation in which we can no longer keep the other, in my case, Japanese, not rich, non-human, outside. And actually, we must involve it actively in our own situation. Old conceptions about culture and nature are no longer applicable. We find ourselves together in an ecological milestone. There's agency in the living world that extends beyond the human. And by walking in the footsteps of Japanese knotwood and not considering it as an enemy, by looking at other ways of living, of living together, and an alternative ontology, we are discovering how we are thrown into the world and who is neither friend nor enemy. Many ornamental plants have been introduced to Europe over the centuries, but relatively few of them became invasive, which was due to the unsuitability of the European climate. That has changed in recent years. Moreover, Japanese knotweed has always developed well in the European climate, especially along rivers and on the edge of the human areas. After some extensive research, it has been shown that the capacity to colonize, which is a precondition for invasion, is dependent upon global warning, disturbance, and the specific features of the species concerned. The battle against Japanese knotweed and its extirpation through burning poisonous pesticides or imported efforts has turned out to be undoable. And it ends in frustration, moreover, given that the propagation mostly takes place through human agency. And many non-native plants are going to become invasive as well in view of the increasing climate change. Conservationists also have a problem with the fact that Japanese knotweed as a profiteer colonizes native species and thereby kills them out. But regeneration belongs to the tactics of nature. Plant and human are part and parcel of this. They are neither passive nor fragile. Nature's change, nature's art, and artists change. Professor Dixon, the well-known archaeobotanist from Glasgow, and sharing his knowledge during our webinar states, Japanese knotweed usually stays in human environments where the disturbed soils it likes are mostly found. This is exactly as William Robbins once recommended. Apart from knotweed, Consibot was also responsible for the propagation of almost a hundred other Japanese plant species, some of which sooner or later went wild. Think of the wisteria, the badlaya, and the privet. Plant animal shops are still trading all over the world and seeing to an increasing propagation of animals and plants beyond their actual habitat towards human areas all around the world. Propagation takes place through conscious or unconscious transportation from ships and trains to shoe soles. This is uh, a screen print that I made printed on poly bags found in the River Clyde, alongside the River Clyde. This is an artist we invited. Uh, the, this was our first webinar, a webinar with the giant Knotfleet Pan Flute Ensemble by Ingela Ehrman, and she demonstrates that by making pan flutes of Japanese knotweed, hollow stems, a different relationship to the giant knotweed emerged based on mutuality and creativity. I will quickly through her mot d'emploi. To get to know the Japanese knotweed, is what we try to do in the webinars. And we try to do it through the Japanese knotweed as a bot or through the webinars as a botanist. And in the second webinar, uh, we did some plant printing at home. So uh, the, the public could follow us in the instruction and they received afterwards a letter with the written instruction. And on the uh, side, are, is a, um, are these pictures. We investigated at the time, behaving as a botanist, plant printing at home, the relationship botany printing being non-native and the image of the Japanese knotweed. In the same webinar, 
Dr. Helen McCormick explained Joseph Banks' dominant role in the execution, printing, and production of botanical illustrations. Joseph Banks and the sober economics of practical publication, printing and publishing before the Flora Japonica. It's an agent in the Anthropocene, and it is a colonized, but it is also a colonizer, like all of us, basically. That is why I set up a, and I'm in the middle of setting up an ambulant research lab to research and to investigate with the audience that printed image of the Japanese knotweed. This Japanese knotweed herbarium and botanical research lab is the moderator of my weird kid project and the PhD, where experiments, discussions, prints, investigations in the routing of the Japanese knotweed will take place. Research expeditions in Scotland, Japan, and the Netherlands originate in and with the Japanese Knotweed Lab, visible to the public at the website. How does the HT of the Japanese Knotweed shape through its participation, its host, urban society? What political issues are at stake when in integrating the Japanese Knotweed in urban space? Considering the relationship between art, culture, and politics, can collective action through creative engagement, in my case, printing, shape new social and political climates? Those are prominent research questions. Of course, due to COVID time, I didn't have the opportunity to travel. Hopefully, the coming year it will be. Here I am showing you some of my monotypes, etching monotypes of different weeds, not only mono, not, uh, not the Japanese, not weeds. And this is the Japanese, not weeds. Professor Dixon opened one of the webinars stating that Japanese not wheat increases biodiversity and no British plant has been exterminated by the spread of Japanese not wheat. A non-native plant is distinct from a native one in that there is evidence that humans have brought it to the area in question. In the case of the Japanese knotweed, this is indisputable as non-native having brought to Europe in the early 19th century. This makes it a neophyte. Had it been transported prior to about 1500, it would be called archaeophyte. In Britain, there are plants of unclear status. Oh, I see. Mistake. This was what Professor Dixon stated at the second webinar. If we think like Kinji Manishi, the Japanese biology and philosopher, opponent of Darwinism in his book, A Japanese View of Nature, The World of Living Things, he wrote in 1941, we can see the Japanese knotweed as another species, as important a part of nature as we are. About a hundred species have been born in Glasgow area in the last two centuries for a variety of reasons, from urbanization to modern agriculture. And indeed, the Japanese knotweed grows fast, but it's not a newly evolved deadly enemy. It's just an ordinary plant. It is us, human beings, spreading the word because of unjustified fear and spreading the plant because of moving earth. In Rotterdam, a city in the Netherlands, there's a restaurant that cooks with Japanese knotweed. And as Ingela Eerman had already shown it, organisms and their environment can no longer be clearly separated. Plants, animals, and microbes no longer just adapt to their environment, but they also modify it substantially. We have to seek a new relationship to that environment. It should be seen, as Latour argues, from an essentialistic point of view, that the concept of nature and the non-separation be na between nature and culture is adamant. Like playing music on a flute made with the root of the knotweed, or these young shoots as vegetable for these pigs. Or, for instance, medicines against Lyme disease. Nectar for bees, like Robinson already said it, or natural ink 
paper and even liquor. The latest news, I think it's not really good news, but anyway, I would, didn't want to hold it apart from you, is that Amsterdam releases 5,000 leaf fleas, again, imported from Japan to hold Japanese knotweed spread. Alien species banned in attempt to control destructive plants. It made me think of the movie The Birds by Hitchcock, because we never know if these fleas are eating up the roses that are next to it, et cetera, et cetera. So here you see one, uh, one of my webinar um, pupils happy with the Japanese knotweed, which is already in flower, although it is not yet summer or it wasn't summer at the time. My conclusion is that scientific interpretation of nature is a discipline that has most clearly evidenced cultural dependency from Thales and Aristotle to now. Esi Manishi, who has been studying evolution since 1941, claims that Darwinism errs in overemphasizing the individual when in fact the sort is a real entity, nature encourages continuity, mutual, mutual relationship and stability. According to Imanishi, the basic concept is coexistence and not the Darwinian competition principle. Change is progressive and coordinated in cells, organisms and in populations. In evolution, all individuals of species changes at the same time when the moment arrives. It's a maturing process, not a random mechanical change in few genes. Darwin lives in the West and Imanishi in the East, he writes. Western culture exalts individualism. Life is a competition. We see each other as a competitor. While Eastern philosophy, religion is impregnated with a sense of solidarity. The preponderance of the society over the individual. The interesting question is no longer how can we contain Japanese knotweed, but rather how does Japanese knotweed develop together with other beings and things, changing our relationship with it and other, in which collaboration and coexistence are key principles. When this question is answered, we see at once that the image of the Japanese knotweed can be modified by making some prints together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for your uh, for your interesting paper. I think uh, I don't. Do we have any uh, questions, Pippa? Yet? Uh, not yet, but perhaps could I just ask one? Um, you mentioned that they, the plant was first introduced into Europe in the early 17th century. Did it not spread then, or was that because things weren't as heavily developed and earth wasn't turned as frequently, or is it, was it the climate, or what happened to it? I, um, uh, I'm not a biologist, uh, so uh, it's just intuition. But from what I've read, um, I think you might be right. The uh, Japanese knotweed uh, thrives in uh, Europe because of our climate, but also because of our moving around. Uh, so at the time, uh, there, it, there wasn't much moving around. It was the 16th, 17th century. They were just remaining at their place or but not much traveling. Nowadays, uh, for instance, if you take the Japanese knotweed uh, with a little bit of earth and uh, you throw it away, uh, then it can propagate immediately because of its roots. It has a rhizome and uh, uh, the rhizome, the pieces of the rhizome, which are not visible, are taken within the earth. Thank you. Anybody else got some questions? I think you've given us so much to think about. We're all slightly stunned into. <laughs> here, we oh, have, wow. have, here we have. Sorry, I've just lost it. That's not very clever of me. Ah, here we go. Where is it? Was Gavin? Sorry, Frank I've lost. I keep losing it. Sorry. Here we go. Um, so Gavin, Gavin Franco asked the question. I'm interested in how the public reacted to your interaction with this plant. 
Well, it's what I found out is uh, exactly what I hoped it would be, um, is that uh, the people are, the public has been influenced by the media as all public has been influenced by media nowadays. So if you write a book which is against, or an article which is against the Japanese knotweed, and, and you influence the public uh, with this um, picture, this image, uh, then you think it's uh, uh, it's our enemy. But if you uh, make the public work with uh, as a botanist uh, with uh, seeking out their own Japanese knotweed piece, bringing it to the lab laboratory, uh, opening it up and uh, making it uh, inking it up, and then printing with it and uh, gently folding out the leaves there gets a new relationship in between the plant and uh, the public. It, it, you get a different view. So, um, yeah, I, I don't want to go uh, too much into politics, but uh, if we confine it just to sensory experience, which is lacking also these days, um, you see that there's a different perception by the public. Um, there's a, 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 a comment, really, rather than a question, from Assos, saying that the problem that he sees the or she sees the problem is that the plant doesn't share its environment with other plants; it wipes out other plants. And, it does. Yeah. Yes, it does. That's my com comment. Um, that's my comment. And while it's fine to keep it in the lab, it shouldn't be let out in the neighborhood because it does wipe out everything it grows over unlike most plants which you can have a community of plants you don't have a community of plants with japanese knotweed it keeps going until it, it and it just wipes out everything it gets to so in that way as i said it may be very interesting in the lab with ink or drawings or other things like that in the in the countryside it's a disaster area which is why it's been made a, a problem, you know, and why it's people try to kill it off. Uh, that is true, but there are many other plants that are also a problem, and I think that is basically what uh, uh, what I want to say is that uh, the 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 media make it an enemy, um, and uh, if we embrace. Uh, the plant uh, and have a look at what we humans have been doing to the planet, then we can uh, approach Japanese not within a different way. How do we approach it in a way that allows us to have any other plants in our garden? Well, I don't know. I, I, it's like it will kill thing. off anything else in your garden. I don't know about that, but there are methods to, uh, if you keep it short, for instance, uh, uh, it, it doesn't spread so much. It spreads vegetatively. It doesn't, it, you can't stop it spreading by stopping it flowering, which you can do with a lot of plants. If they don't flower, they don't make seeds, they don't spread. But uh, Japanese knotweed spreads by roots underground. And so it, it you know, even if you cut them back a bit, it just slows it. It's not, it doesn't stop it destroying everything in your garden. <laughs> okay, well, that brings us to uh, uh, how much you want to control the garden. This is also a very Western European way of thinking. I think most people don't want a single plant only in their garden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's quite pretty though. It's quite a nice plant. It's quite pretty. Does anybody else have any questions? No? no. I wonder one, sorry, may I just ask one more possibly? Um, you, you raised the, the question of medicines and things. Would, is that, that not another avenue to defend, if you like, the Japanese knotweed. To be, I mean, I didn't had no idea that you could use Japanese knotweed for. I can't remember what you said. Various ailments. 
Um, it's, it's, oh, it's, a, it's a positive message that's been got out there. It is. Well, there are loads of possibilities to use in Japanese, not weed, uh, like the the, um, the restaurant, which makes liquor and, and uh, it, it tastes a little bit like rhubarb. Uh, so yeah, you can make uh, cakes with it and juices and it's very, rather wholesome. So I quite agree. Uh, like for Sibut uh, and his garden, Miss Madison Garden, you can use it and as a medication. And if you read uh, uh, the books about the medication made from the Japanese knockweed, uh, it's, there's not so much research to it, but it's a very, um, how would you call that, immunitive, uh, wholesome uh, medicine. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question here from Helen McCormack. Um, the hey, boxes, Helen. <laughs> the boxes that carried the plants you showed are fascinating. Have you found any examples von Siebold's innovation in this area? Any examples? That's uh, uh, von Siebold's innovation in this area of plant transportation. No, I have. Well, I've seen some bags, some funny bags, and some crates. Apparently, he uh, he used crates, but that's all I found up till now. Thanks, Fran. Uh, thanks, Catherine. That's really interesting. I, I think it's a fascinating area that might be worth um, a little bit instigating, of, definitely. Yeah, kind of thinking about that, how those, you know, the the kind of um, gathering of the of the plants together and how they were, because obviously, as you mentioned, there were lots of problems with transporting. Yeah, the plants and some were more successful. Obviously, the Japanese knotweed was more successful than others. But I just thought those boxes that you showed were really interesting and it'd be great. The ward cases, yeah. Yeah, it'd be great to see more of those um, objects, yes. Thanks yeah. so much. Um, could, could, I, could I just ask, um, couldn't, couldn't we say that we can appreciate it aesthetically and medically, uh, but acknowledge that it also creates problems um, as a plant uh, grown for uh, ornamental purposes, it does. Can can couldn't we appreciate? Couldn't we say we can appreciate it, it aesthetically and medically? So we appreciate those aspects, but we also acknowledge, uh, of course, that uh, that, it, that it, it's problematic. Uh, I mean, it isn't. I guess what I'm saying is, do we have to look at it as an either or situation? No, I don't think so. I th I'm, uh, I think that it's much better to um, realize the world as it is. So uh, not thinking about enemy or friend, but more about uh, the facts of life, the facts how life is now, nowadays at uh, planet Earth. Yeah, thank you. And I think also that if if we uh, do if we investigate uh, with our as a botanist in a printing class uh, with our sensory experience, uh, that we become more human and and that we um, go back more to our own uh, being. Yeah quite philosophical story about that <laughs> right well are, are there uh, if there aren't there's, any... there's one more question may i put that oh, yeah. uh, this is from sarah keenan um, with its latin name being fallopia japonica the plant seemed gendered fallopia nai, and regularized yeah. does it does its categorization as fallopian relate to its capacity for reproduction <laughs> Well, the, um, uh, the variety that we have in Scotland now is, um, is in fact a grandchild of the plant of uh, von Siebold. And um, it is feminine uh, and it propagates uh, through the rhizome. So, I think it's very interesting, and I'm going to do the next webinar about that. 
it does need a man, which is quite interesting. In, in, in what respect do you, could you explain? Well, well it's, you can propagate it through its wise own roots. Doesn't need yeah. to be cross pollinated or anything. No, it it it, no. it it spreads vegetatively. Yeah. So the roots, you know, it grows underground and comes up. New nettles do it as well. And mint. So um, yes. So I, I don't know if it can if it can um, reproduce sexually. Most plants it can. can. Can it? it? Yes, it can. I think so. I'm not a biologist, but I've read it can through the flowers. Mm. Mm. But we have to ask Professor Dixon. Mm. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Catherine. It, it's uh, it's it obviously is is a bit controversial, uh, your position, which is always useful and interesting. Um, and I'm sure you find that quite uh, generally when you you discuss it and in your webinars. Um, uh, but uh, it's 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 very interesting, and the 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 information that you provide about Seabold is very interesting, uh, mm, and and his uh, plant journeys and interaction with Japan um, is something that I didn't know about, and I'm fascinated to hear about. Um, so so thank you thank you very much for that and thank you for your argument um and and uh, we wish you the best of luck with your phd uh, thank you very much we uh well report back to us let us know how how it goes <laughs> i will i will and thank you very much for presenting me and giving me the occasion to present my subject well, we, you're you're very welcome. So thank you. So if we uh, unmute ourselves and give a applause to Catherine for thank you so much for coming. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And could thank I, you. Uh, could I um, announce for the for, we have one more seminar this term, uh, which is in two weeks' time on the twenty fourth of June. And uh, Stephanie Bowery from the University of, of Leicester will be uh, talking about uh, my galleries were fair, large and long, my garden sweet enclosed with walls strong. Uh, she'll be exploring the relationship between early modern gardens and the art and art galleries in England. Uh, so uh, we recommend, we hope that you'll come uh, uh, to that seminar as well. Um, so thank you all uh, and thank you again, Catherine.